Hi there, I'm Bo Gruber. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to be sharing this presentation with you. Um, thank you so much for watching, wherever you're watching from. I am in sunny Southern California where you can't see, but it's beautiful outside. There are palm trees. Um, so I'm feeling very lucky about that. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just really happy to be able to part of, be part of this event and share this work with you. Um, so I'm going to jump over into my presentation now. Okay, let me go to full screen. Okay, um, so uh, like I said, I am uh, Bo Ruberg. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers of this event for the invitation. It's, it's really an honor. Um, so here's what I'm gonna talk you through today. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about this intersection of queerness and games and video games, which is the uh, work that I do. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about this idea of the queer games avant-garde. So this talk today is kind of a focus on um, my new book, which is conveniently right here with me that came out from uh, Duke University Press earlier this year in um, March of 2020, um, which is called The Queer Games Avant-Garde, How LGBT Game Makers Are Reimagining the Medium of Video Games. Um, and then in talking about what I'm calling the queer games avant-garde, and I'll explain that in a sec, um, I'm gonna draw out some themes and threads across the work. I'm gonna talk about some differences and some tensions, and then hopefully um, kind of leave us with some new ways of thinking that um, I'm hoping will give us some generative uh, new perspectives that can carry across moments and content. So just a quick introduction to me. Um, so I am a, a professor at the University of California at Irvine. Um, I also run uh, with my colleague Aaron Trammell a lab that's called CATS, um, which is very appropriate for folks to do research on uh, the internet, among other things, um, which is called, uh, so that stands for Critical Approaches to Technology and the Social. Um, and we are a group of faculty and grad students. You see some of our really amazing grad students pictured here. Um, who uh, do work on culture and technology and often specifically video games. Um, I, broadly speaking, work on gender and sexuality in digital media. Um, queerness and video games is a focus for me. Um, and my background is uh, in new media from Berkeley. I was at the Interactive Media and Games Division at USC, so some game design experience. And then often I am um, in dialogue across academia, and the games industry through events like the annual Game Developers Conference. So these are some of the uh, books that I've written and been a part of, uh, just to give you a sense of kind of the different ways that I approach my scholarship. Um, so the first project is called Queer Game Studies. Um, it's an edited volume that I edited with Adrian Shaw, who's a professor at Temple. Um, and this is a volume that brings together lots of different voices to explore what it means to put together queerness, LGBT issues, gender and sexuality, all of that with games, um, video games, analog games, kind of any experience of play. Um, and that's been a really foundational text for sparking a lot of amazing work in this area that we now call queer game studies. Um, Last year in 2019, my um, first monograph came out, which is called Video Games Have Always Been Queer. So that's a book about how we can use queer thinking, queer lenses to um, analyze video games that may not seem to have any LGBT content. And then my most recent book um, is also kind of different. So you can see how there's, there's kind of different approaches. Um, this latest project, like I was saying, is called The Queer Games Avant-Garde. And as you'll see, this is a collection of interviews and profiles with independent um, game makers, independent game designers who are queer or trans and who explicitly bring their experiences of gender and sexuality and identity into the work that they make. So before jumping into the Queer Games Avant-Garde specifically, I wanted to give you a kind of quick crash course in this intersection of queerness and video games. Um, I can tell from some of the presentations on the schedule for the event, some of you are already familiar at 
in work that kind of combines queer and trans studies with digital media, but often people kind of think about this when I tell them I work on queerness and video games. Uh, they have this impression that it's really niche, it's really small, and that's not true. There's actually a ton of stuff at this intersection, so let's unpack it really quick. So when I talk about queerness, which is a word you'll hear me say a lot, um, it's worth remembering that queer has a bunch of different meanings. So one thing that we mean when we say queer is it's kind of an umbrella term. Um, and it encompasses anyone who falls outside of the uh, norms of gender and sexuality, what we call heteronormativity. Um, so that is not just folks who are gay, but also you know, folks who are bi, who are um, trans, who are intersex, lots of different types of folks. So not everyone identifies with that term. Um, but then there's also a kind of more conceptual use of the word queer and queerness that you see a lot in uh, academic queer studies. Um, and it's this idea that the queer is, is what resists or even rejects norms of sexuality and gender. Um, and then depending on the kind of branch of queer theory you're in, that might even extend out from gender and sexuality into kind of um, resisting and questioning norms of identity and power more broadly. So that's the queer side of the equation, but then the other side of the equation is video games, right? Because we're thinking about how they intersect. Um, you all may well know lots about video games already, and if so, that's great. Um, but I do still find that as game studies scholars, we often encounter um, people who are still new to this medium, who still have certain stereotypes about the medium. So it's worth saying that um, when I'm talking about video games, I'm not just talking about um, big budget games that are, you know, what we call AAA games that are very popular, sometimes um, have problematic representations of women or uh, lots of violence or are for kids, right? This is kind of the way that society often still thinks about games. Um, but I'm also thinking about lots of other types of games. So casual games, puzzle games, games for different demographics weird games you kind of hear me say throughout that I, I love like weird surreal colorful things that's for me uh, as a queer person and a game player that's what really resonates with me um so these are just some of my favorite games from the last few years but there's a whole world of uh, work out there that i mean when i say video games so what do we find at the place where these two things meet queerness and games like i said there's a lot here um, there's too much to cover in a, in a brief talk. Um, I'll also say that there are lots of people doing work in this area, so I am definitely not the only person working on queer game studies. Um, I am really lucky and honored to have a whole community of um, fellow scholars doing this work. And so you'll see different people explore different elements of uh, this intersection. So one thing that people often talk about uh, when they think about queerness in games is the representation of LGBT characters in mainstream games, these big AAA video games. Um, and uh, we are seeing more and more examples of that kind of representation. I think it's, it's slow, but it's increasing. Um, so you have characters uh, like Tracer and Overwatch. Um, most recently, Ellie in The Last of Us Part Two has gotten a lot of attention. Um, so uh, those are really um, prominent examples. <laughs> One second, I'm going to close my windows. You get the very real world experience of what it's like to be uh, social distancing and getting this talk from someone's bedroom. <laughs> this is my office in my bedroom. Um, so what else do we talk about when we talk about uh, queerness in video games? Another thing that we can talk about is uh, community organizing and uh, community groups. So I am one of the co-founders, um, co-organizers of this really amazing annual event called the Queerness in Games Conference, um, which uh, has happened roughly every year since 2013. Um, it's a really amazing space for bringing together queer and trans folks who study games, um, but also who make games and kind of crossing over in that way of thinking. We can talk about uh, queer games history. Uh, so for example, this was the Rainbow Arcade event um, or show in Berlin that happened a few years ago. It was an entire museum show just dedicated to queer games history. 
Um, we can talk about the place of queerness in game fandom. So the way that fans bring queerness, bring um, their queer experience to games through um, the way that they reimagine them, the way that they interpret them. Um, a lot of the work that I do when I write um, kind of individually, when I do more queer theory thinking is around what it might mean for video games themselves to be queer. So what I mean by that is that we can look at games that don't seem to explicitly represent gay people, you know, trans people, these things that we might expect from more mainstream representation. Um, and we can say that in some ways they resonate with queer experience. So um, some examples of that are things like um, Octodad, which came out in 2014, which is one of my very favorite games, um, which is about an octopus trying to pass as a human man um, and walking on land. Um, and you can kind of hear how that has some real echoes of a queer experience of passing and trying to fit into um, a normative society that's not designed for you. Um, Natalie Lawhead's Everything is Going to Be Okay is another great example. Um, this is a, a game that's a series of tiny little games um, that are um, kind of frantic and strange and take over your desktop. Um, and so I think it's worth thinking about how the design of that game, um, as well as the content of it, really challenges norms. But the thing that I'm gonna focus in on now is uh, this, this idea of the queer games avant-garde. So that's another piece of the intersection of um, queerness and video games. So when I say the queer games avant-garde, what I'm talking about is a network of queer and transgender game developers who are at the forefront of contemporary game design. So you may hear talk right now about the fact that games have really been changing in the last, gosh, it's hard to say exactly, five years, 10 years. Um, and we are seeing um, a rise of indie games, of course, although that's gotten complicated in and of itself, um, but also a real push to think about the medium in ways that go beyond what we would expect. So how video games can communicate emotions, how they can enact social change, um, and how they can be a form of um, really politically radical artistic expression. And the argument that I am making with this project, um, and I think really fundamentally this argument comes from the work of these game makers themselves, is that um, whether we recognize it or not, uh, the medium is changing because of queer and trans people, that they really are at the forefront of these shifts. Um, so the queer games avant-garde is a term that um, not everybody identifies with, so it's, it's not uh, exactly a community. So the, something to clarify is that there's a history to the queer games avant-garde, but also people have come to it at different times from different places. So often people think about the origins of this group um, as coming out of um, a kind of group of artists working in um, the East Bay in Berkeley and Oakland, uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, starting in roughly 2012. Um, so we see people really inspired, for example, by Anna Anthropy's Anna Anthropy's books. Anna Anth that's hard to say. Anna Anthropy's book, Rise of the Video Game Zinesters, um, which is kind of a call to action for people to be making their own games. Um, and so this this was a really important kind of um, moment that sparked the rise of queer indie game making. Um, but today we've seen this just really go much much further. Um, so this is a screenshot I took it's actually a little while ago when we were already at um, 1,230 results for games tagged with LGBT on um, itch.io, which is the uh, you know, online platform for distributing independent games. Um, so this has gone far beyond the um, individuals who have become better known for making queer games. This is now a, a wide, widespread phenomenon. Uh, so in order to explore this, what I did for this project is I uh, conducted a series of interviews with um, about 25 different uh, game designers who were working across different areas of queer game making. Um, you can see some of the folks here, people like Dietrich Swinkofer, Robert Yang, Jess Marcotte, Avery Elder, Maddie Bryce, Nikki Case, and I'll talk about their work more in a little bit. But the idea with this project was not to write um, a traditional academic book where you kind of sit down as an individual and you say, 
here's what this all means. Um, certainly I do some of that too. But uh, there is this uh, really rich, vibrant, already quite intellectual range of work out there. Um, I think what you see in, in these queer games is actually that even when they're fun and playful and strange, um, they're already engaged in a lot of critical and theoretical thinking. So the idea was instead to turn to game makers themselves, um, hear how they understand their work, and therefore to value uh, the narratives that they tell about their own creations. Um, so some of the goals with the project were to go beyond the standard diversity narratives. Um, we often see reports about um, new games coming out that have LGBT content that come along with, you know, promises that uh, video games, excuse me, are getting better. And games as a medium, as a set of cultures have um, unfortunately a pretty well-deserved reputation for being homophobic or being exclusionary. Um, and so this kind of work, this queer work, gets sucked up into a narrative that uh, games are getting better. And maybe they are, but there's actually a whole lot more that we can talk about um, beyond that kind of like simplified neoliberal narrative. Um, I was hoping to create a text that could inspire both academics and designers by bringing together those perspectives and again, to center the voices of the marginalized folks making these games. Um, in talking to them, uh, just a little bit of kind of the methodology of this project and the method, um, these were long form interviews, so about two hours each, which is a long time to talk to somebody. Um, they did receive a, a stipend for their time. Um, it's important to pay marginalized people for their time. Um, but what I was really hoping to get at was, uh, more to the story than, than most folks were asking. So thinking about their personal background, their aesthetics, their artistic influences, and especially the politics of their design. And that's something you'll hear me say a few times is that um, this work is expressly political. And that's not just something that comes from my interpretation, that's actually something that you know, across the board, almost everyone I talked to talked about the politics of this kind of game design. So um, I'm going to draw out a few different things across these works uh, there. Like I said, there's so much out there. There are so many artists. So in order to kind of present to you some of the things to, to think about, I'm going to talk about themes and threads across the work. Um, and then I'll talk about some differences, some tensions, um, and then we can, what we can kind of take from it. So some themes and threads. Um, one of the things that I saw across these interviews uh, that we see across the queer games avant-garde is the idea of resisting empathy in questioning audience. So this is a kind of common narrative around queer games and also, you know, any kind of video game, uh, analog game made by a marginalized person, this idea that it should foster empathy in the player, that there's an imagined straight cis player who should learn something and learn to step into the shoes of a marginalized person. Um, and actually the work that we see here resists that. It says, no. This isn't necessarily for straight people or cis people. This is not to let someone step inside our shoes. Um, so you can see that in a few different examples. Um, there is actually a, a really, really fascinating set of works by different queer games avant-garde artists um, that expressly critique empathy. Um, here on the left, you can see an image from Maddie Bryce's Empathy Machine, which is a piece where um, you actually play one of her earlier games using a controller that is mapped to her body. Um, so it's a way of saying, you know, if you want to try and step into my experience, you're going to have to confront the realness of me as an individual. Um, and we also see it in uh, some of the work by artists like ABB, who um, was one of the creators of We Know the Devil, um, which is about um, trans kids at summer camp kind of becoming monsters. It's a really interesting bridge between monstrosity and transness. Um, so here's a quote from uh, what ABB said about her work. She said, I'm not trying to make games for straight people. At some point, I had the revelation that I didn't need to make work that was accessible for as wide an audience as possible. We know the devil is super autobiographical, but it's also about me starting from that autobiographical history and finding alternative avenues out of it. So what I want to highlight here is, number one, this idea of not making games for straight people, making games by queer and trans folks for queer and trans folks, but also this resistance to the autobiographical. So even though this is a game that comes in part from ABB's experience, 
Um, it's not just about handing someone else a replica of that experience, it's about finding alternative paths through it. Another theme that we see is queer games avant-garde work often explores and embraces intimacy. So an example of that um, that I really love is a work by Shauna Musgrave, who is a um, VR artist called Animal Massage. Um, and Animal Massage is, I think, a really interesting example of how intimacy can meet vulnerability um, in a kind of queer digital experience. So how it works is that um, Shauna uh, shows it in kind of gallery spaces or um, game spaces like Indiecade. You lie down on a pillow, you can see that here. You put on a VR headset um, and various things that Shauna does in real space in front of the audience in the gallery affect you in the VR space. So right now she's moving a feather, in this image she's moving a feather over someone. They can feel the feather, but what they see in the VR space is them, a bird flying over them. Um, my favorite part of the installation is uh, that when you're in the VR space, you see kittens approaching you and nuzzling you. Um, but what's happening in real life is Shauna is wearing mittens that are mapped to a camera and she's actually nuzzling your face with the mittens. So you can see how this is not necessarily a literal representation of, of LGBT experience, but it is a way of challenging norms of games that bring together physical intimacy with kind of vulnerability. Here's what Shauna said about um, her work. She said, I wanted to have a personal one-on-one -on -one connection with the person who was having the VR experience. A lot of my games are touchy-feely, and part of that is figuring out how to relate to people. When you're queer and trans, your methods of being in relationships are more improvised. So I love that idea of touchy-feely, right? That that's something that we think of as maybe silly or in some ways bad, but kind of reclaiming that. Um, and I also want to draw out here that Sean is expressly talking about um, the link between queer and trans experience and this mode of design. We find that uh, Queer Games Avant-Garde work draws from personal and embodied experience. So um, it's not the kind of work that uh, tries to tell, you know, big, broad stories about um, being marginalized. It's not the kind of work that goes to other people and says, you know, tell me about your experience so that I can replicate something I haven't experienced. It comes very much from the personal. Um, so one example of this uh, that I find really fascinating because it's kind of unexpected is the work of Andy McClure. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna skip showing you the video just in terms of time, but I do recommend looking it up. Um, this is a game, it's kind of a game, kind of an you know, art experience called Become a Great Artist in Just 10 Seconds. Um, Andy uh, made it in collaboration um, with uh, some other folks. And um, it seems super abstract. So it's kind of just like you're messing with art, you are playing with um, computational aesthetics, um, seems totally unrelated, right, on the, on the surface, seems totally unrelated to queer and trans experience. Um, but here's how uh, Andy talked about it. She said, part of why I'm drawn to abstraction is that it's like an escape from my identity. As a trans person, there are always things about my physical external self that I don't like. Video games or abstract art are a place where you don't have to have a body. To me, there's something that feels really good about floating in those abstractions. So I think what's, what's worth paying attention to here is that we see um, these designers talk about how queer and trans experience comes into the representational content of their games, but actually we also see the opposite. So here we have um, a trans game designer who is saying, you know what, actually the absence of my body, the absence of narrative um, is in some ways more reflective of and more true to my trans experience. Um, than explicit representation would be. Um, and then the, the last kind of theme that I'll draw out here is that queer games avant-garde work often understands design itself as queer. So I think this is an especially valuable takeaway for folks who are um, interested in doing design, who are working with designers, working with developers, that um, it's not just the final product that we can understand queerly, it's also the process itself. Um, so an example that I find um, really interesting is the work of Laura McGee. Um, so Laura's work is probably best known, her best known game is um, called Curtain, but she also makes a range of other um, really rich work, um, including games that she thinks of as flat games. 
that are built out of um, different bits of art materials. Like she will, uh, this is her game, The Isles Full of Noises. It was made this way, um, using markers, um, drawing out art assets, and then needing to kind of splice them together and work with a messy, limited process to see what she can create. So here's what she said about um, her design process itself. She said, the way the game looks is based on serendipity and the chance of what happened before. I love finding ways to bring unpredictability into the creative process. You might say that's a way of querying video game making. It's definitely not a very straight way of approaching things. So here we can see that it's actually in uh, the act of deciding what goes into the design, what goes into the aesthetics, that there is a resisting of standard ways of making games and a queering, a kind of upending and reimagining of that process. So those are some of the threads that run throughout this uh, you know, body of game makers and their work, but that doesn't mean that everyone agrees. That doesn't mean that we're seeing only one set of uh, themes, um, and there are definitely differences and tensions um, that come out in uh, the interviews in this book, but also more broadly through this work. So one thing is uh, this idea of whether or not there's a queer games community, and I kind of hinted at this earlier, that um, there are some folks who feel like there is a, a real network, we might even call it a movement of queer games. Um, and that's something I often feel very tapped into as someone who's been uh, closely involved with this conference for years, the Queerness and Games Conference. There's always an arcade, there are always lots of uh, designers there. And to me, it feels like there's actually a really robust community. But that's not actually how everyone feels. Um, so on the one hand, we have um, events like different games. Um, there's an interview in the project from uh, Sarah Schumann who has been kind of foundational in this event called Different Games, which brings together um, conversations around queerness, race, gender, identity, um, and games, um, versus someone like uh, Liz Ryerson. This is her game Problematic that you see here. Um, and Liz talks in her interview about actually feeling kind of like pushed out of the games community, feeling like the work that she does is more closely tied to her interest as a musician, to her ties to kind of internet cultures, older internet cultures. Um, and I think it's important to highlight this, this difference because if we kind of bundle everybody up and say, oh, it's just a, it's one specific movement, it's one specific community, then we risk um, conflating everyone's experience into something uh, monolithic and it's not. Another tension that we see come up is this question of whether queer games should represent queer sex. So this is a debate that uh, comes up in other forms of media too. How we should represent queerness, what's the appropriate way, what's the politically um, actually most radical way. And what we see in the queer games avant-garde is that some people believe strongly that it's a stronger political statement to represent queer sex. Some people believe it's a stronger political statement not to. So for example, uh, we have work like Robert Yang's games. Um, Robert Yang makes work that is often explicitly sexual um, about subcultures of, of sex between men. Um, this is uh, Robert's Rinse and Repeat. Um, you might know games like Hurt Me Plenty, which are about flogging. Um, his most recent game is called The Tea Room, which is about um, inspired by uh, the classic book Tea Room Trade about sex between men in public bathrooms. So in speaking to Robert, uh, for his interview, he has the sense that explicitly representing queer sex in this medium that has been homophobic and has um, been wrapped up in a kind of homophobic masculinity, that's radical, right? To bring queer sex into games. But then on the other hand, we actually have a lot of designers who feel differently. They feel like when you put queer sex into a game, um, it becomes exploitive, it becomes performative, it becomes a way of reducing queerness and queer identity to sex. Um, so one of the ways this comes up is around this game Dream Daddy. And um, I wouldn't think of Dream Daddy as part of the queer games avant-garde. It's made by Game Grumps, which is a group of uh, actually largely straight and cis people. Um, but it's a, it's a point of conversation for a lot of queer indies. Um, and Dream Daddy is a game that's all about dads dating other dads, um, but it's actually quite stripped of queer sex. Um, and some people feel like that's great because it doesn't reduce queer experience to sex. 
some people in this uh, group actually explicitly think this is a really problematic game because it takes queer sex out of the equation. Um, and this is one that really speaks to me. There's a tension here between uh, what we can think of as a brighter future versus a queer apocalypse. So by that I mean um, there's a tension between folks who think about their work as making things better going forward, sometimes through education, making a better future for uh, queer people in games, but also just queer people in general, um, versus this other theme in uh, queer games avant-garde work that I think is really powerful, um, which is about the end of the world. Um, and especially at this moment um, of you know, global health crisis, of, of climate change, um, we just had a series of, uh, I mean, they're still going on, the wildfires here in California that are just, uh, you know, hard to even fathom. Um, there are uh, people explicitly exploring what it might mean to be queer at the end of the world. So on the one hand, we have examples uh, like work by Nikki Case. Um, Nikki makes uh, games that are explicitly about educating people, about allowing people to understand marginalized experience, often understand dynamics of discrimination. Um, so this is Nikki's, uh, one of their early games called Coming Out Simulator, um, where you can kind of understand what it's like to uh, go through this process of coming out in um, a relatively culturally conservative family. Um, so that's what I would think of as kind of making things better, right? You can, you can learn about this, you can become more sympathetic if this is not your experience. Um, and then on the other side um, is uh, this game that I find really compelling um, called Gender Wrecked um, by uh, Ryan Rose. I, Ryan Rose, I never know how to say your last name. I always want to say Acacia and that's not right. Um, I love you, Ryan Rose. Um, which is about um, the post-apocalypse. It's about a world after our world has ended. Our world has been destroyed by a mysterious force called gender. Um, and you are now um, exploring different planets, talking to different kind of alien creatures to understand what was this thing called gender. Um, and it's very surreal, but it's also very powerful. Um, the uh, image on the cover of this book is actually from Gender Wrecked. Um, so uh, what I find really compelling there is a, a kind of step away from this narrative about things getting better and instead embracing the idea that um, in order to find a queer future that may work for queer and trans folks, we may need to destroy the world as we know it. So I'll just close by thinking about um, some new perspectives that this work brings us that hopefully we can take into other work. So one of the big takeaways here is, is also where I started, which, idea, which is the idea that video games are changing. I do think that's true. And they are changing because of queer people. So queer people are at the avant-garde, are leading that charge, even when they're not getting that recognition, they are um, the kind of spark of change. There is a fundamental value in thinking about theory and culture through design. So I mentioned that um, these are designers who are already thinking in what we might imagine as intellectual ways. Um, I went into these interviews thinking, like, because I was silly, thinking I'm the academic, I know the, the kind of intellectual side, these folks are, are in a creative position, um, they'll have something different to say. And actually, they are already absolutely thinking about queer theory, thinking about um, critical theory more broadly, thinking about um, the poetic and artistic meaning of their work. Um, and I think in that way, they are a really inspirational model for how we can do work we might think of as intellectual and academic work through the process of design. Um, and then this, I think, is a, is a way we can kind of think about putting all these things together. So um, we have this idea that the personal is political, right? That's not uh, unique to the queer games avant-garde, but that's certainly relevant here that people are drawing from personal experience, embodied experience, and that that is a way of getting at larger systems of um, power and oppression. But we also see that work that is political is often weird. I think there's a real radical value in not just thinking we have to look to games that are expressly about politics or expressly about large global issues um, in order to find something that is disruptive, that reconsiders um, what games mean and what life means. So when we see games that seem silly or seem surreal, that is also political. That's a challenge to the norm. 
Um, and then we have the tie between the weird and the queer. Right. So queer, you know, has its origin as a derogatory word um, that means strange and then becomes a slur for LGBT people. Um, but I think there's a way to kind of reclaim that weirdness through work like the work of the Queer Games Avant-Garde to find the things that are strange and intimate and messy um, and to think about how they can challenge our ways of thinking and our ways of playing. So I'll leave us there. Um, thank you so much for listening. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, it's been lovely to share this work with you, and I hope that we will get a chance to talk um, during the um, Q&A.